everybody. This is Brian Yellow. This is Mirage, speculating on speculative fiction and other topics. Today, we are going to be talking about Christianity and speculative fiction. I have Jill Perazzi. Um, she has actually agreed to come on and be an expert today on the field. And the reason for that actually is because you spent a majority of your childhood out in the world, actually, as a missionary, yeah. correct? How, yeah, can you tell missionary me a little kid. bit about your, your background before we get started? Yeah, um, well, my parents are the missionaries. Um, so they, uh, they started working in Papua New Guinea, which is a small island country above Australia, um, long before I was born. So I first went over there when I was, uh, I want to say, nine weeks old. Um, nine weeks. Yeah, so, you know, we'd come home for furlough every four years, we'd come back to the States for a year. Um, and then my parents retired from the field when I was 17. That's like Polynesian so, culture, right? It's like right next to that Polynesian area. It's it's actually Indonesian, um, but it's like right next to it. And, and yeah, like when Moana came out, I was all geeking out because they had a whole bunch of artifacts <laughs> yeah, that I recognized. They did such a great job on that, too, didn't they? They, in terms they, of they did an amazing culture. job. Um, and you're an avid reader. You've read your entire yes. life. And yeah. it wasn't just, you know, you didn't just have the Bible. You read all types of stuff growing up, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we, were, we were really in the books, my whole family. So. And, and in terms of being, you, you consider yourself a Christian? Yes. Did, were you limited in terms of what you were able to read? Um, not really. Uh, there were a few books that my parents weren't okay with. Um, but for the most part, you know, we, we were pretty much good with anything. Um, so, you know, even things like Harry Potter, a lot of Christian kids weren't allowed to read. And my parents read them first. Um, but they were fine with us reading them, watching the movies, stuff like that. So. And as a writer, and you, you write science fiction. Yes. But you, we've discussed this before, you don't put Christian themes in your novels. Yeah, well, Christianity, it's a lifestyle, it's a worldview. So, of course, my worldviews do come in, but I don't write specifically Christian fiction. Um, so, you know, the characters aren't Christian. Nobody becomes a Christian at the end. Um, I, don't, I don't really discuss God or, or religion or any of those things. Okay, well, that's interesting. So where are we in terms of Christianity and science fiction? I did a little bit of research, and yeah. uh, what I discovered is one of my favorite series, and I knew this growing up when I read this, C.S. Lewis, obviously, yeah. has a huge Christian theme. I mean, uh, you know, Aslan, the, the central figure throughout the novels, the one character that kind of pops up in every single book is obviously a god figure or even yeah. a jesus type of figure throughout every single one of those books um that's a big one right yeah. um you have uh another series that i really like casca this is a mercenary who is ordained is made to live forever as a mercenary until christ comes again i mean that's definitely a very christian oriented book Mm -hmm. um, what have you discovered in terms of research and Christ, uh, the Christian themes through literature and science fiction, speculative fiction? Yeah, well, um, it seems like it's a little bit harder to find um, specifically Christian science fiction. It's becoming a little bit more popular. Um, and it's it's hard to do searches to try and, and find because if you search like Christian authors and science fiction, you're going to get Christian science fiction, which isn't the same thing as just having a Christian author. Um, but yeah, C.S. Lewis, uh, he did write a specifically science fiction series, I believe, as well. Uh, Narnia uh, he, was, we, he was speculative. Too. Uh, he was a skeptic yeah. as well for most of his life until J.R. Tolkien kind of turned exactly. him the other way. Yeah, yeah, he started out He started out as an atheist, and he, um, if you read the book Mere Christianity, that's by him. It, it explains um, his, his worldview changing over to Christianity and, and that whole process. Um, and unlike Tolkien, um, Tolkien wrote Lord of the Rings, um, and he was a, a Catholic. And that um, was also a very Christian-oriented book that has lots yeah. of uh, the symbolism yeah. in it and whatnot. But Tolkien was very firm that it was not allegory. Now, there's a lot of Christian themes in there, um, but 
Tolkien was very firm that it wasn't allegory, whereas Narnia is allegory, um, being it, it's a fictionalized version of Christianity. Um, so you especially see this in um, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, where Aslan, who is the Christ figure, dies for um, the salvation of a particular character who's sinned, um, Edmund, who has betrayed uh, his family. And that's depicted as a sin as, as we as humans have betrayed God and Christ has to die for that uh, and then is raised again. So that's very specific allegory. Mm -hmm. Where do we see that type of stuff in um, science fiction? I, I read the same thing that you did. I actually saw some of the science fiction, um, like the, uh, what do they call it? Um, the science adventure stories, the devout Christians, where they have guidance from God, or there's an actual yeah. non-Christian on board, and the stories about kind of turning that person um, to be born again at one point or another, or... yeah. Um, you know, they're they're definitely kind of like the romance novels, but Christian oriented, where instead of sex, they're kind of turning the non-Christian to God. Yeah. <laughs> right. I mean, is yeah. that a fair way to look at them? Exactly. I mean, it's it's, you know, just like there's specific markets for, you know, any audience, there is yeah. a specific type of fiction that's written for Christians. And I actually. Um, and I wrote a three part blog post on, on my views and why I write what I do. And, and one of the first blog posts addressed why I don't write Christian fiction. Um, and that's specifically because I, I find a lot of Christian fiction and it's not intentional, um, but it, it turns into a type of propaganda where, you know, the unbelievers are viewed as these horrible people and, you know, they all turn to Christ before they die. And it's, it's really, bad writing in a lot of places, which, you know, as a Christian, I believe that God is the creator of beauty. So there's no good reason for us who know God not to be able to write a good story. Except we limit ourselves by, you know, all these fake rules that we set up. Um, which is why I don't write Christian fiction. But I think in science fiction, it's a little bit harder. And I think that's because for so long, um, and it, this viewpoint is starting to change, especially in the Christian community. But for so long, the viewpoint was science and Christianity are at odds. They are enemies. Um, and so it's hard to find good science fiction that was written by a Christian because a lot of times the science fiction authors felt like they needed to hide that fact um, or write, you know, full on Christian science fiction. It's very interesting. I mean, do you feel at odds with uh, do you feel at odds with the science at all when you write? Not at all. Not at all. Um, now, I am personally a young earth creationist. I believe that God created the world. Um, and I do when I write, I write from the viewpoint of evolutionists, uh, which I don't agree with that. But my characters are scientists. So that's the way they would view the world. Um, so there's a few things that I'm writing that I don't personally believe, but when you're writing a character, you know, you're stepping outside of your beliefs and your understandings anyways. Like I wouldn't personally go murder someone, but my characters might, um, you know, so you're, you're stepping out of that anyways. Um, but yeah, I, I don't, I don't feel at odds with science at all. I believe that science supports Christianity. Um, so I don't, I don't feel out of place writing in science fiction. Do your stories take place in space? Um, well, I don't really want to say because it's kind of a spoiler, but I guess that already <laughs> gives it away. <laughs> um, the uh, just for those anyone who wants to read the malfunction. Let me ask you this: then. Would, fair you, would you ever write a story in space? Oh yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. My my only hesitation with that, I'm not really big into soft science fiction. I'm not really big into to space opera. Space um, opera, yeah. Swords in space, as me and Jason exactly. decided we're going to call them. <laughs> yeah. So you know, I and I do enjoy a few. Like I love the Voltron cartoon, and that's I mean that's science fantasy. It's not even really science fiction or space opera. Well, that was the thing that I was thinking about with, in terms of Christianity. Because I mean, obviously, this planet is split 
in three ways. You have the Eastern religions, you have, you know, you have the, uh, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? The, uh, the, Abrahamic. The, thank you. The Abrahamic <laughs> religions. Yeah. And then I guess everything else. What, how many, are there, there's a billion people that practice those type of religions. Yeah. Right. I mean, you can't move away from it. And when you're writing, you have to put that stuff in there. When you look at that that show, that wonderful show, with uh, oh man, where'd my brain go? <laughs> what was that guy's name that we love so much? Mm. The brown coats and oh yeah, wow. um, Firefly is that? Firefly, yeah, yeah. And there was a religious guy, the shepherd on that show, right? Yeah. There was a Christian overtone to that. I mean, they weren't necessarily calling each other this, you know, Jesus or whatever, but there was a there was a Christian kind of theme to that, right? Yeah. I think Christianity has been so influential, especially in the Western world, that um, even in like and I haven't read or watched Game of Thrones, but I've seen a lot of clips and stuff. Even a lot of the um I haven't like, watched this religion. last episode. So if you're about to spoil it, I will no, never no, forget. No, not you. at all. Um <laughs> the uh there's like a major religion that has like some some major uh, yeah. Catholic Spira, religions. Something along those yeah. Uh, and yeah, it's a very it's very Christian like. Yeah, especially the Catholic because um the Catholic religion has really had power um over a lot of like medieval European. That's how I was raised. Everything. Then when I went to Rome, uh, when a few years ago, like five or six years ago, I was very impressed with the Catholic Church. Yeah. I'm very yeah. gold and very everywhere you turn there was a chapel. Everywhere you turn there was a gigantic cathedral. Everywhere you turn there was the papal influence. Yeah. And it was like, oh my God, this is my childhood. You know, this is the priest standing in front of a congregation. I was, I went to mass and listened to it in Italian and Latin. It was like, wow, yeah. this is so impressive. Yeah. And that's especially in the medieval era. Um, the Catholic church was, and, and they were basically more of a political entity than a religious entity. And they just had complete control um, over the entire European, just everything. Yeah. Um, and so it's it's hard to find, especially in fantasy, any religions that aren't influenced by the Catholic religion. Totally it's right. So pervasive. So you, you know, you have I mean, that phase. whole class is exactly. Based. Yeah, exactly. Um, so you know the the Christian influences, especially when it comes to religion, are going to be everywhere. But also, even just you know the the viewpoints on sin and morality and all those things come from from Christianity as well. And in the past, in the history, I mean, it's not necessarily maybe true today, because I mean, I guess the Westboro Baptist Church can put its root, uh, the, the sparrows can put its roots in the Westboro Baptist Church and whatnot. But um, the, the, the idea of love and acceptance, too, in a way, which doesn't really show up too much. I mean, it gets demonized in a way, but the good yeah. parts of it don't really show up. But it does in Firefly. When you look at the shepherd, he's more of the the holy good guy, right? Yeah. Um, there are good elements of it that kind of show up in places. Definitely, whole, definitely. Yeah, the well, if you just, and, and I watched the interesting YouTube video a while back. It was kind of a mini documentary that was talking about names, especially in science fiction, and talking about how many names are influenced by Jesus Christ or by uh, Jewish um, religion, which is uh -huh. Jewish is is the roots of Christianity. Absolutely, um, yeah. So you have, you know, if you have a, sh a hero, a lot of times they're named Shepherd, um, because Christ is a good shepherd, or they'll be named David. Um, you have a lot of, you know, 666 showing up, or uh, Lucifer, or things like that. Um, demonic stuff, uh, demons are, you know, everywhere through fantasy and science fiction. And That's amazing, actually. You think about the color red, too, as being symbolized exactly. by the devil. And, and fire. Looking at Star Trek, you know, the Klingons are kind of drenched in red, and the demonic figures of the Star Trek universe. Yeah. Yeah, so it's, I mean, it's everywhere. It's, especially because science fiction and fantasy is written by a lot of people in Western culture. 
So um, we're, there's going to be a lot of influence from Christianity, whether they mean it or not. Well, they have to, right? I mean, because we are writing from the culture in which we are in. Exactly. We can't get away from that. We can't reinvent where we're coming from. Yeah. And I mean, you you have said that you don't write from that perspective, but I wonder if you can look at, I love how this train has decided right now. Can you hear it? <laughs> oh, right yeah, now is that. when it's got to honk its horn and tell the other train that it's passing under this bridge to drive by my house. <laughs> <sighs> Just right before I got on this podcast, I was looking out this sliding glass door and the curtain decided to fall on top of me and I had to rehang it. I was like, oh my goodness, this is great. <laughs> One thing after another. Right? Oh, goodness. Um, what was I going to say? Thanks, train. All, all my, uh, my train of thought is completely gone. <laughs> I think you were talking about uh, my perspective. You were going to ask oh. something about my perspective in writing. <laughs> I mean, a sense of your, your, your sense of morality as well. The sense of, uh, obviously, you're going to have a protagonist. Yeah. Obviously, you're going to have an antagonist. Obviously, you know, you're going to have a, a cabal of characters surrounding both of them. They have to be affected by your sense of good and bad. Yeah. Your sense of the world as well. As a child, as a missionary in Papua New Guinea, the people that you've met, your parents, the interaction they had with the world around them. Mm -hmm you know, have to come from this idea yeah. of Christianity. Yeah, and that's um, my, one of my greatest influences and my, my viewpoint on this is the great Russian authors, um, particularly uh, Dostoevsky, who wrote uh, Brothers Karamazov, however you say it. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm not even going to pretend like I know. Because... <laughs> But what do they call uh, just, it? For like alphabet? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's Russian is it's a beautiful language, but it's not one that I'm going to pretend to be able to pronounce. I guess if we drank a lot of vodka, we'd probably be able to move us very well. But yeah, D uh, Dostoevsky was he had Protestant leanings in a very Catholic environment, and so he didn't quite fit in in, in the churches. Establishment. He was kind of back and forth, and when he believed, and when he wrote um, the brothers Karamazov, he um, he addressed religion, and he spoke about it. And in fact, uh, a lot of the greatest apologists that I love talk about one particular chapter that's talking about morality from a Christian perspective. One one of the characters is a Christian, and the other is an atheist, and they're kind of arguing about it. And so religion really factors largely into that book. However, you can read it as an atheist, as an unbeliever, as anyone, and you don't feel like he's coming at it from like a preaching perspective. He's asking questions as a character. It's very, very real questions that aren't slanted. Um, and he has an underlying theme about morality and about um, about how we choose right and wrong, but he doesn't force his opinions on you. And I think that from my viewpoint as a writer, I think I have to respect my, my reader and I pose questions because I want to get them thinking. And, and as a Christian, I believe the answer to those questions, you know, are Christian, are to God. So, for instance, in Malfunction, one of the main questions that I ask over and over again through my writing is, um, what makes a human life valuable? You know, why, why are we fighting to keep other human beings safe? What's the purpose of that? Do you have um, an answer? My answer as a Christian would be human beings are valuable because they're made in the image of God. You know, it's not because of what they can offer us. It's is that not, the answer you come back to in your books over and over again? No, not at all. And that's because I believe that that's the answer. And I want to respect my readers enough to pose that question to them and allow them to think it through themselves. And you know, that's funny that you say that, though. I wonder in Christian literature, in terms of the Chronicles of Narnia or mm -hmm. even in the J.R.R. Tolkien, what makes, you know, the good guys in uh, the Fellowship of the, uh, the Lord of the Rings worthy, more worthy 
than the the elements of Mordor. You know what I mean? What makes the good guys worth more than the bad guys? Because they're the they're, they're the, they're the, the the forces of light versus the forces of dark. What? Why are the forces of dark not worth as much as the forces of light? You know what I mean? Yeah. Maybe they had good ideas over under uh, Morden or whatever his name was. Maybe he had some good ideas for the world. Maybe he could have fixed all the ills. We don't know. He wasn't given any chances to <laughs> exactly. share yeah. his politics because why? You know what I mean? Because he wasn't the focal point of the novel, or yeah. he wasn't actually you know the 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 allegory of the Christ or whatever. I think who was who was Al, uh, uh, Aslan's nemesis? He doesn't really have one, right? Or was it just the the, the humans? Um. Well, in the majority of the books, it was um, the White Queen. Uh, Jada, I believe her actual name is, but she's just called the White Queen. Um, and she is, she's not so much a depiction of Satan as she is a depiction of, um, of humanity who has chosen to set themselves up as God and chosen to, to not come back to Christ. Um, and you really see that, I think, in the, the magician's nephew, which is kind of her origin story. Um, but after she dies in the, uh, um, the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, there is there are other books with other villains in them. Um, I think, I'm trying to think of which ones come afterwards. We have the Snow Witch. I remember her. Yeah, and that's she's the same one in multiple different stories. I believe she's also in Prince Caspian as like the Green Witch. Um, well, they don't they don't come out and say it exactly. Um, and then in the sequel to Prince Caspian, I believe there is no direct antagonist. Um, it's just kind of a journeying story, and then. Yeah, there's a few other with a few other antagonists, but for the majority of the books, it is it is the the Queen Jada, the the evil witch. Okay, I haven't read those books in a long time. The good thing about yeah. having kids is I'm going to have an opportunity to read them again. Exactly. I can't wait, actually. Exactly. <laughs> and it's Gerald Tolkien is is my absolute favorite author, and I uh, I think one thing that people fail to understand when they criticize his his lack of um, morally gray characters um which it's common for literature in those days yeah, things were much more simplistic but you have to partially understand that tolkien wrote that coming out of a um extreme ptsd from fighting in the world wars oh yeah he had a bad guy <laughs> he yeah, had a definite bad guy war. yeah um so so he was writing it less as, you know, kind of his viewpoint of the world and more as him trying to cope with the nightmare that was his life during the World War. I believe it was World War One. And two. He had yeah. children, or maybe potentially children fighting in World War Two. I mean, his country was fighting in World War Two. He'd lost you know, millions of people. I'm what I think uh, I heard that, you know, 600 people died every hour in World War Two. I mean, yeah, it's insane. The World Wars were just atrocious as far as human lives lost. It's like in the Battle of the Somme, which he was in the trenches, you know, I think the number was like 6 million people died just in the span of a few months. I mean, that's a war. Yeah. That's a battle that he died or survived. Yeah. Died. yeah. So that's I think a lot of, of Lord of the Rings, especially if you understand the kind of things he was seeing in battle, a lot of Lord of the Rings is that, is yeah. him dealing specifically with that. And of course, his Christianity comes into it. I think the Silmarillion, much more than Lord of the Rings, has Christian themes because it has the origin story, it has the creation story, and that has a very clear satanic figure and God figure and all that kind of stuff. And that's very interesting. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, it's interesting because it's all there, like we were talking about in terms of culture, our culture, mm -hmm. going forward into the science fiction, Christianity and science fiction. And then you have the science, the, the actual Christians writing science fiction. Mm -hmm. I mean, writing specific science fiction. Um, I don't know. 
Christianity and science fiction. Yeah. Yeah, like I said, science fiction is it's a little bit harder to point out. And I think it's I mean it's just it's the same with themes. You'll you'll still see Christian themes there. Um, I guess you even have the the speculative, um, not speculative, I keep saying that, but you have the uh, skeptic nature in science fiction as well with the, the uh, Star Trek, yeah. which takes religion com almost completely out of the the, the genre yeah. <clears throat> in a way. I mean, it doesn't have it there at all, except maybe with Spock in terms yeah. of the Federation. And his well, is only... Go ahead. No, no, please. I was going to say that there's a, a new kind of movement in science fiction that's, I mean, it's not entirely new, but it's, it's taken on, which is the cyberpunk, which is actually what I write in, I write in biopunk, um, which is really closely related. Um, the, the idea of transhumanism, um, which is, I mean, the Christian themes are still there, but the Christian themes are now the enemy. Um, or huh. that's so interesting. Yeah, because there's there's <clears throat> this with the transhumanism movement, there's this this concept of we can become gods if we replace enough parts and if we download our minds into the computers, if we and the, the enemy then is the people who are holding you back, who are, you know, you need to live a normal life and die as as human beings. And there's this weird ground in between where, you know, there's the Christians, or at least the the public viewpoint of the Christians, which you know, it's the Christians standing there and saying, "Oh, everything is evil, and you shouldn't clone, and you shouldn't whatnot." Um, and then there's the transhumanists who are like, "Okay, let's just download our brains into computers and all become AIs and live forever." Yeah, but what is the you? That's the problem with. That's what I keep thinking of is exactly. what is the you? Exactly, and that's. There was that's, a great podcast the other day. I listened to a lot of Joe Rogan. He's one of my favorite podcasters, and yeah. he had a physicist on who asked the question: If you replaced a, a neuron in your brain with a, you know, mechanical cell, would you still be you? And then he asked another question: If you replaced two or three or four or five, would you still be you? And I started thinking about it. What is you though? Whoa! A yippee dog. Sure. <laughs> yes, that's the poodle. <laughs> and the question, I mean, where are you? You know what I mean? You're not really, are you in your brain? Are you behind your eyes? Are you your stomach or your chest? I mean, where are you? Can you pinpoint you? What are you exactly downloading? Yeah. I mean, you're all these chemicals and things you slowly develop from being a child or a baby or these impulses. Yeah. I mean, these mess, these mistakes that you make. I mean, you're not this thing that was born 40 years ago. You're not going to be this thing that dies. Hopefully, 40 years from now, you're you're ever evolving and changing and becoming something different every single moment you're alive. Exactly. And what exactly would you be downloading? I think it's just complete bullshit. You're yeah. not going to be downloading anything. Yeah, and that's the that's the extreme transhumanist side would say you are. That's all. Of that is just your imagination. That's neurons firing in your brain and you can replace those neurons with any other kind of electricity and so you can download yourself whereas the christian side would say you have a soul there's something apart from just the physical there's there's something deeper and something more and this also comes to the question of personhood you know so one of the questions now that's being asked a lot in science fiction you'll see more and more ai and the AI is starting to change from when AI was first really introduced and popular in science fiction. You know, you think of Eagle Eye and um, iRobot and whatnot. Have you yeah. ever done anything physically? Have you ever accomplished anything physically impressive? Like run faster than you've ever run, done something like lifted a heavy weight or jumped farther than you've ever jumped before? Like accomplish something physically impressive or... I've never been a very physically active person. So. <laughs> I don't know, broken a bone, hurt yourself, a yeah. scab fell out off of a wound. I mean, these things that we do physically, they become part of you, right? I mean, yeah. if, is it part of your soul? Because when I bench press the most weight I've ever bench pressed in my life, that becomes part of who I am. And that's connected to me physically too. Yeah. And if I, my soul separated from my body, what happens to that thing that I did? Yeah, for the, for, the Christian, for the Christian viewpoint, or at least 
my particular viewpoint, I know there's different viewpoints on this, um, I believe the human being is both the physical and the spiritual. So um, we believe that when you die and go to heaven, um, your body will be raised up and perfected and joined back with your soul. So you're not just going to be this ethereal spirit floating around in heaven. You're going to have a physical body. You're going to have the same physical body you have now, but perfected. And, so how does that know, manifest itself in, in science fiction? I think, I think one of the big things is, you know, like I said, this transhumanism movement, um, but it's also the question of personhood. Um, which is explain, explain personhood personhood would be um more so than what is human because what is human we can answer with uh, can we i don't even know pretty because <laughs> you it's you, starting to change as a, with, i mean most christians you eliminate the idea that we were anything other than human ever right <clears throat> we never act, point, yeah. yeah depending i mean we've never we never achieved anything beyond this we never came from anything else. We never were in caves or we never achieved anything beyond this yeah. thing that we are right now. Yeah. Well, even now we have, we have um, CRISPR, which I don't know if you're familiar with CRISPR. No, no, I do. I know. Okay. I'm right. My current novel actually kind of looks at that idea. Yeah, that's, um, it's a large part of mine as well. And that's, like I said, the transhumanism, that's a part of it as well is, is the um, genetic modification. Um, so, you know, with genetic modification, that brings a whole new gamut of questions to the what is human debate. But for, for now, um, it's pretty clear, you know, there's a human with a human DNA and there's a non-human, you know, say we have a robot that's not human. Personhood is deeper. That person, personhood is a question of what is valuable on the same level as a human being. So the way you value your wife is gonna be different from how you value your dog. You might value your dog and love your dog, but your dog doesn't have the same value as your wife, you know? Um, so, you know, this comes into the abortion debate. Is a child in the womb? Yes, it's human. Science answers that. It is a human being. Is it a person? Does it have value in the womb? on the same level that a born human being like your wife would. Um, or, you know, this also comes into the AI debate. Like at what point do robots become advanced mm -hmm. enough that we recognize them as fellow human beings and they have the same rights as human beings? Is this a question of morality? Is it a question of, of social ideas? Is it a question of, you know, and as Christians, we believe that the, the spirit, the soul, is what makes something a person, uh, and that it's created the image of God. My um, one of my main characters in my novel kills every single thing on his planet. And it mm -hmm. answers that question fairly easily. Yeah. <laughs> Immediately, yeah. that's like my first chapter. He just, I just murdered everybody. That's pretty awesome, actually. <laughs> that would be a great opening chapter. Talk about a hook. And, and he moralizes it. And he just says, eh, I needed all the, I needed everything. They got in my way. Yeah. <laughs> he wakes up after like a million year nap. I'm just bored. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. And we can moralize anything, which is why right. morality is a big question as well. In science fiction and fantasy, it's one of the best ways to explore it. Whereas with, um, historical fiction it's a little bit more murky am i losing you no i'm here oh okay you got quiet there for a second <laughs> um i i i think it's interesting because you can and in terms of religion you do moralize things you oh. can decide right or wrong even on the on the off chance that you're completely wrong or right mm -hmm. i i enjoy the idea of you know, you can decide something's a person, especially when you're planning on throwing that person in a privatized jail in 18 years or in front of bullets in 18 years. I mean, it's a costly decision on the part of a government to legalize or illegalize something. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. It's and that's, that's one of the In the name questions. of religion. You know what I mean? It's like. Yeah. Well, in the name of anything. anything. In the name of anything. I mean, you can make science fiction that. It's just very, it's very interesting. I like dystopian futures in mm -hmm. which you can, 
make people do whatever you want yeah. as an investment. Yeah. Well, there is, you know, just, just from a standpoint of here and now, we dehumanize the things that we are okay using, which is why human trafficking exists, which is why, in, in my viewpoint, why abortion exists and euthanasia, we dehumanize to moralize. So there is, there is a way in which we can say, oh, well, um, they're okay with this. They're not on the same level as me as far as personhood, um, you know, racism, all these things. So, you know, it depends on the culture and the context, but it's definitely a huge thing you can play with in science fiction and fantasy, you know, in science fiction, dystopian, it's, it's a huge theme of yeah. that, you know, well, they're not yep. as human as me. So I can do to them what I want. They're poor. <laughs> They're yeah. the little people. I'm a huge politician. I'm yeah. going to make it very difficult for them to have a good life. They're going to be poor. They can make they can commit crimes. I can put them in prison. Exactly. I can make I can make them work for slave wages for the rest of their lives. Yeah. Um. It's it's very it's very interesting. Have you um? Maybe this is stretching things a little bit. Putting conspiracy theories in this this realm of speculative fiction, but. Are you familiar? I hate this man. It just drives me crazy. Pizzagate. Have you heard of this thing? No. Do I oh, want to? <laughs> no, you don't want to. I have I have kids and I heard about this and it just makes me so sick. But it's about the politicians and people in charge using children as sex law. Oh, it's so horrible. But anyway, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's like it's one of those things where they make something that has so much meaning seem meaningless with such a nothing title. You know what I mean? Yeah. Pizzagate. It seems like nothing. What's Pizzagate? Oh, it seems so innocent, but then it opens a floodgate of such horribleness, such a horror-filled type of world with a meaningless title. Yeah. And that's science fiction and fantasy is so helpful for being able to address these kinds of things that we are used to in our culture. We have normalized. And so we quit questioning them. But if you package them up differently and, and put them in a dystopian or you put them in a alien world or you put them in, you know, with elves and dwarves and you package it a little bit differently and bring a different perspective and a different culture, it can change your mind pretty mm -hmm. drastically. So it is science fiction and fantasy and other speculative fictions are just so important for that, I think. Well, I mean, I think ultimately what we've gathered is that Christianity and speculative fiction comes from your culture, and you really can't move without it. Uh, I love the story of the Golem. You know, mm -hmm. it's a it's a Jewish myth, right? It's a the rabbi wanted a helper, so he made a Golem, and he stuck a Jewish symbol on its forehead, and it did its bidding. And <laughs> what's the rest of the story? Do you know? And it went crazy and started killing people. Something yeah. along those lines. I mean, it's just this monster story, basically. But at the end of the day, it comes from a specific culture. It's religiosity yeah. at work. And it doesn't work without the, the rabbi, or does it? It's Frankenstein. It's Frankenstein, yeah. which also That's, has a Christian element to it. Exactly. You know, Frankenstein is probably my favorite um, classic. And it's, you know, it definitely influenced malfunction that the question of what would happen to that monster then if that monster was loved you know I, I don't know have you read Frankenstein all the way through or just <laughs> have I seen the movies seen the movies yeah, anymore in movies in culture in, in the culture of Frankenstein <laughs> I mean it's been exactly it's like how many it's people been a lot. it's I'm supposed to be reading it I have a mirage set up in the middle of the month with a uh, another author I'm supposed to be reading it right now. So amazing. So amazing. You do, you know, like it? Do, you think it, do you think it sticks? I think, like I said, it totally influenced Malfunction and that, that question of, of what would happen to Frankenstein's monster if he was loved, because the entire story is, is Frankenstein's monster looking for love. But of course, that again kind of brings in that transhumanism because can a corpse become, become a person, even if it's not recognized as a person, even if it's recognized as a monster? You know, yeah. Uh, 
you know, and, and at what point is a person a monster, you know, after he murders multiple people, at what point did the monster become a monster when it was first raised as a collection of pieces of corpse or after it started going crazy, you know? When does transhumanism actually start though? I think that's, I guess, the question of your Christianity, right? In terms of your beliefs, when does transhumanism start? Does it start when we go beyond the atmosphere and we put a space station in the, you know, in orbit? Does it start when we put a space station on the moon? Because that's stretching it. Does it go when we decide that the planet's round and not flat? Does it go when we bandage our, you know, we put a, because I have a, uh, what's it called, a, a thing on my ankle because I fractured it so bad when I was in the army. Is that transhumanism? Because I've mm-hmm. actually repaired myself beyond the limits of my body. Yeah. And that some people would say yes. Um, and that's more the transhumanism side, actually, you know, they would point to these kind of things. Oh, well, you have a pacemaker, you have, you know, um, clothier implants, you have whatnot, and, and technology can do amazing things to help people. So I'm kind of in the middle ground on that. I don't believe we should go trying to download our brains into computers. I don't think it's going to be effective. I think we're just going to have really, really smart computers computer programs that can act like us. <laughs> I um, think we're just going to have wasted space. I mean, I don't think it'll ever work. <laughs> I don't think people it'll work. will be convinced that this computer program is their mom alive, and it's not. It's just a, a very cleverly disguised lie. That's, I don't know. That, I, there's I don't think it'll do process. anything. I, don't, I mean, I honestly, I'm at, I love the idea of Richard Matheson's What Dreams May Come. Mm. I read that book and I saw the movie, obviously, the <clears throat> the Robin Williams movie, but the book was amazing. That's when I started thinking about death, you know, the idea yeah. of something after death in the universe and this fabric of existence and there has to be something else out there and what God is and all that good stuff. And yeah, <clears throat> and really, and especially when you have kids, I mean, you just sit there and look at them and you're like, oh man, just for the sake of them, I want there to be something more. Yeah. You know, the skepticism is like, oh, dude, there's, why not? Let's think about that. Yeah. I mean, you can think about, you can decide there's nothing all day long. You go, fuck it. You know, you're going to die. There might as well be nothing. Yeah. Fine. But you have kids, you're like, I want there to be more. For them, I want there to be more. Yeah. So you start playing around with how there can be more. You start playing around with what is God. You know, that's where it gets fun. You know what I mean? That's where things start to be enjoyable opens yeah. up these doors of possibility in fact it's been flavoring my fiction to a huge degree oh, what yeah. is god what is consciousness what is this thing called life what is this thing beyond death that we could play with you know what i mean i mean oh man it just opens up so many possibilities this yeah, end well, this end beyond life you know that's it dead end you're done it's so boring it's just so boring and definitive answers are just, it's, to me, is so boring, too. What humans have decided the answers are, it's like, no, I'm sorry. I don't like that. I just want to play with it. I want to mold it in my hands like clay. Like, mm-hmm. I like that, but I want to play with some more over here. I want to mold something else. I just yeah. want to play with it. Why not? Because, you know, ultimately, I'm going to die. And so are you and everybody else's, too. Whether it's Christianity, Jewish, Buddhism, I love yoga. If Christianity had something like yoga, <clears throat> I don't know what's in my throat, but I can't get it out. Hey, there's a church near us that has Christian yoga. <laughs> <laughs> is, <laughs> is it just regular yoga they put Christian stuff on top of? Yeah, instead of, you know, opening your heart to the universe, <laughs> you can just start praying. <laughs> oh, my goodness. That's horrible. I haven't <laughs> gone. I've done some yoga, and I, I enjoy it. I don't believe in the... Um, the Eastern medicines, you know, I, I have a scientific mind and, and the idea of chakras and stuff. is just a little bit. Oh no. I, you know what I do believe in though, is like the idea that cheap, my, uh, the instructor said something really interesting. She said the idea of yoga is to strengthen your body so you can meditate. You yeah. Know what I, mean? I thought it's like, wow, that's interesting. She doesn't go into like the third eye bull poo or whatever the <laughs> hell she's like, it's like just to strengthen your body. It's not to heal your body. It's to strengthen your body so you don't hurt yourself later on in life. It's functional strength. I love it. It's exercise. Yeah, it's exercise. Yeah, it's yeah really- that's what you were talking about with the, the idea of death and whatnot. Um, Harry Potter was written 
around those concepts, especially the last ones with the um, the Deathly Hollows and whatnot. And I I've listened to a few um, interviews with J.K. Rowling, and I and I can't speak definitively. She would have to to speak her own mind on this. Um, but I, I do believe that her struggle with the concept of death definitely definitely um, sank into her fiction quite a bit with Harry Potter. Um, so, you know, the, there is those bigger questions of what science fiction and fantasy are built around. It's not just, and it's all fun and games, you know, with swords and, and epic battles and elves and- It can be, right? Aliens. I mean, yeah. it can be just fun and games. It can be, oh, the guy grabs his sword and lops off some heads, or it can be yeah. the idea of the universe and what it actually is and- Exactly. Like looking at the more, in you know the the, the finite yeah. nuances I, of it i don't believe you can escape putting themes into your fiction i think that's that's what stories are if There's you're a good writer you're going to be looking for ways to put themes into if your you're a good writer you control the theme the theme doesn't yeah, just I pop agree. up randomly and and you know fire all over the place with like a hundred different themes like you control the theme and it and it sinks into your fiction and I, you know, I'm still trying to to find ways to strengthen my own skill in that. But that's I think that's where short fiction comes into play for me, honestly. That's where I like to explore a lot of my ideas. Yeah. Where, where am I wanting to look? What do I want to play with here? What do I want to have my ultimate theme be? Mm -hmm. um, is it going to be artificial intelligence? I mean, is it going to be transhumanism? Um, am I looking at a way to, you know, explore what being human is? I mean, what is the planet that my characters are existing on? Why do they want to escape? What is being a soldier? I mean, I've been playing with that since I've been, I left the army. Yeah. You know, all that exists in this novel that I'm writing right now. And then beyond that, I'm writing a fantasy piece. You know, what is mythology? What is God? What is being a king or what is being, a, you know, yeah. <laughs> what is being somebody forced to marry a king? You know, yeah. blah, 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 blah. Yeah, and I definitely play around with religion a lot more in my fantasy. But I think for me, and I think most authors do have, they have one particular overriding theme that kind of dominates in their fiction. And for me, that's personhood. Um, and especially the concept of the human versus the monster. Um, and nature versus nurture. Um, but there's definitely a lot more religion in my fantasy. I get to play with that a lot more. But in in my science fiction, it's very fast paced. It's um, dystopian. It, I just don't really bring it up much. Um, but it, it has been interesting to see my audience's reaction and, and the kind of demographics of the readers. Well, what is your audience? Um, right now, a lot of a lot of the more vocal audience um, is conservative Christian, um, and I think that's a lot because. Uh, I've gotten a lot of readers from my critique partner and she writes uh, her fiction is, is it's not directly Christian, but it's much more Christian themed than mine is. Um, but I've definitely had a few very liberal atheists read my, my work as well and find just as much meaning in it. That's, that's a very interesting thing about um, um, skeptics is that if they're not going to be looking for that kind of stuff, they probably won't find it unless you shove it into their face. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I think there's there's a few themes that I had to deliberately point out to people. And I think that's, you know, if you have to point it out, then it's not really a theme. Um, but there's a few things that I had to point out, like, okay, this is where I was addressing abortion. And they're like, oh, I did not notice that before. So I think, you know, there's a lot of things that they're more for me. They're, you know, there's some of them are, you know, Easter eggs, like things in history that I really like. A lot of my character names are that. Um, but also, you know, a lot of my viewpoints do sneak in and I try not to make it preaching. I'm very careful about preaching. I, I want to trust my audience to, to firstly enjoy the fiction is just enjoyable fiction. You know, we read to have fun, but also to be able to think for themselves. And, you know, my belief is if you're seeking the truth, you know, um, seek and you shall find, knock on the door and it will be open to you. Um, you know, if I have to tell you, then it kind of defeats the point. 
Well, I thought the whole mission thing was to tell them. I think, yes. However, I don't think fiction is the way that that should work out. I think if, if you're doing that with Christian fiction, you are only going to get a Christian audience. I believe that when the Bible tells you to preach the gospel, it's on a one-on-one -on -one friendship basis. And in certain cultures, it does work to do, you know, street evangelism, whatnot. Um, but it's very interesting, actually, if you think about it, because if you're going to hang the, what is it, the John 315 on the, on the 316. football 316 yeah. on the stadium wall, it's going to be only Christians that kind of understand where that comes from, right? It's not yeah. going to be the, the, the guy in the, the, uh, the, the, the rough that's going, oh, I, I'm born again now because I, yeah. I read you know, John 316. There are instances <laughs> of that happening. Okay. There, are there? You know, there's, there's stories. And there's people who would encourage that. However, the Bible says they'll know we are Christians by our love. A lot of times that's extremely alienating. So my viewpoint is that, um, you know, inviting people to church when they've never been to church before, church is for Christians. You go out, you make friends, you ask questions, you care about the person. You enter into life with them. And then you say, look, do you want to know why I'm this way? And it's not that you're going at it with a, a goal of, okay, I'm going to go make friends so I can make them a believer. Um, it's more of an outpouring of actual love. And when you are in someone's life hurting with them and, and loving them and caring about them, I think that's what the Bible wants. And I think that that's, that is... I mean, it's the most effective way to bring people to Christ. Like I said, that's not the goal. It's not, you know, I'm going to go love this person and they'll become Christian. So I get to put a point on my, you know. Um, of course, I think loving someone as a Christian, I believe, you know, I believe in heaven and hell. And I believe if you love someone, you don't want them to go to heaven. So you are going to preach the gospel to them. <clears throat> are you familiar with uh, Charlene, Charlene Harris? The, I'm not. She did the, um, oh, man. Uh, I think she did the Southern Vampire Stories, and it was an HBO series for a little while. Oh, um, I was I'm gonna mess it up. Podcast. I did a podcast on her. Yeah. Vampire Diaries was it? I uh, know that's uh, Rice. Something Rice. No, <laughs> and Rice. No, I don't think either one of those is right. It was on HBO for a while. No, Vampire Diaries is different. Okay. I think not that I'm even familiar with what it is. Um, that's this one better. though is. True blood? Huh? True blood. Yeah. You're not familiar with it though, so it doesn't matter at the end of the day, I gather. <laughs> well, I'm familiar with that. I've never watched it. <laughs> but she's a deacon in a church. Yeah. And she's very guest Christian and whatnot. And she writes about these monsters and and you know, it's you know, vampires are very religious. Monsters are very religious. Oh, yeah. Monsters are very kind of what you're talking about in terms of in the rough calling to God type things. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I mean, if you think about it, an atheist is not going to invent monsters under the bed because an, an atheist is by definition a, um, what's the word I'm thinking of? Someone who believes that science defines everything and, and there's only the material. Whereas monsters are almost, Definitely spiritual. How do you explain yeah. Asimov then? Asimov was a skeptic. I mean, fiction. And he <laughs> is he is the number one science there's, fiction writer yeah. that has ever there's lived. A, oh, maybe he was difference. Jewish though. Maybe yeah, he was Jewish. I mean, I don't know. Let me just look up. I'm going to look up Asimov. That's like yeah, the number. Ahead. That's the first thing that we've actually ever looked up. But go ahead and finish your thought while I'm pulling them up. Yeah, I mean, Asimov. on the one. The one side, it's fiction. You can write things you don't believe in. You know, I, I don't believe that ghosts exist, but I do have a horror story with ghosts in it. Um, however, I think there's a difference Wait, between a skeptic. you had a, a ghost story. What do you mean? You're not allowed to write I about wrote, ghosts? No, I said, um, I don't believe in ghosts, but I did write a ghost story. So you can write things that you don't believe exist. Oh, you don't believe in, in ghosts? Yeah. 
Um, but I think there's also a difference between atheists and a skeptic, whereas, you know, an atheist, like if you think about mythology, there's not a lot of atheist mythology. And atheists have been around. Yeah. I always think that um, atheism is a religious term. That's why I don't refer to myself as that. Yeah. A lot of people would say, and a lot of atheists would say, no, no, no. So it just kind of depends on what side of the fence you are with that. I think, I think the, the term atheism is kind of out of style, though. So. Some people adamantly mm -hmm. refuse to call themselves anything but atheist, atheistic, and I just I hate the term. Yeah. Because it's, it's just a dead wall, and it's insulting in a way. It's kind of like religious people want to refer to you as an atheist, and I think atheists are kind of like, oh, I hate everybody. <laughs> <laughs> and I refuse to use my brain in one way or the other, and it's like, oh, shut up. Yeah, well, there's, there's been a few, a few well-known atheists who kind of, kind of pushed it over the edge as not being quite so popular anymore. Just I, I, knew this, I knew this one guy. He was an atheist. He thought he called himself an atheist so much. He hated religion so much. He just wanted to fight everybody, including every anybody who did not believe in Christianity, whatever, God, Jesus, whatever you want to call it. And he uh, also believed in lizard people. He thought lizard people existed. So I used to rag on him so much. <laughs> I was, I'd just walk up to him and say, hey, man, who's a lizard person? And he would get so mad at me. He just turned red. <laughs> 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 and we'd be watching TV. There'd be news plans. Is that, is that guy a lizard man? And you just watch him turn red. <laughs> There's I also have one of those guys. Conspiracy before. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. I love it. I love lizard men. I love. I love also the one where there is a gigantic underground city under the uh, Denver airport. I want there to be one so badly. I, I love that. That would be awesome. Hey, my uh -huh. book. My book is an, an underground city. It's oh, really? under Denver. Oh, what just happened? That was a full glass of water that just fell. Oh no. Yep. My my carpet's gonna smell like mildew because guess who's not cleaning that up? <laughs> the person who spilt it. I don't know. I think Isaac Asimov was born Jewish to Jewish yeah. millers, which is interesting. And uh, he was born in Russia. That's his nationality. Uh huh. And he went to Colombia, but I think he ended up being a skeptic. So I'm not sure. Oh, it says religion. It says he was an atheist and a humanist and a rationalist, mm -hmm. which all those kind of lead to the same thing. Yeah. He it's railed kind of against superstitious and pseudoscientific beliefs. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't mean anything because the Jewish faith is is very um, grounded in in um and kind of, they believe in the Torah, they don't believe in a heaven, they believe in a God. So it, it kind of, it's a, a very interesting religion. And that's mm -hmm. kind of where everything kind of is based on in the Abrahamic, Abraham, say it for me. Abrahamic. Abrahamic, there's another term though. What's it, what is the term that I wanna say? It's not Abrahamic. Mm, it's the I same one that, what is it? I don't know if I'd be able to help you with that. I can't think of another term at the it's, moment. It's, it's what they call anti, um, anti, um, it's a fartic. <laughs> it's not that though. It's a uh, anti, uh, it's the, uh, when you call somebody, I don't know, it doesn't matter. At the end of the day, it really doesn't matter, but they, it's all three of them. Christianity, Christianity, Islamic and Jewish, they can get lumped up into the same term. <laughs> But um, we're all brothers and sisters and cousins and stuff. It's just amazing how much we hate each other. Blowing each other up and running each other over with cars and vans and, and things. Uh, human nature is a, a messy thing. <laughs> yeah. Yep, unfortunately. Wow, this is fun. Um, we'll do it again if we can come yeah. up with another topic. Or actually, you owe me an author. We'll talk about that if you want next time. Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. Perfect. Um, I have like three things I wrote down, but we covered a lot more than that. I really appreciate this. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Have a great day. You as well. Bye-bye.